Hey guys, it's me, Mrs. Spray, coming to you from Room 72. Now, I understand that some of you guys might have missed the Zoom the other day when we went over the periodic table, and we've got a quiz coming up soon on our first benchmark of work on atoms, elements, and the periodic table. So, I'm making this video for you, number one, because I really love the periodic table, and don't mind reviewing it with you, but I want you guys to be ready to take that first assessment during our virtual learning. So, coming to you live from room 72, here we are with the periodic table. Let's review what we learned about each element block from the periodic table. And I have with me this really cool wooden element block that someone made me years ago. Okay, the middle part of the periodic table block is the symbol. And remember the rule for the symbol is the first letter is always capitalized. And if there's just one letter, it's capitalized. As you can see uh, behind me, all of the element symbols follow the same rule. Okay, this number up here in the upper right-hand corner um, for polonium, it's number 84. And that is its atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. And it's also the number of electrons. Now, sometimes it's also the same number of neutrons in the nucleus, but we don't know for sure until we look at the bottom number. This is the atomic mass. So it wasn't known right away that atoms had a nu uh, neutrons in the nucleus because they had no charge, but they have approximately the same mass as uh, a proton. So what we do when we're drawing atoms in class is we round this number to the nearest whole number so 208.9 would grow, uh, round up to 209. And then we can subtract 84 and figure out how many neutrons there are in the nucleus. And we can do that with anything on the periodic table. That was our first lesson on learning to draw atoms and learning to decode a block from the periodic table. So you might have learned in lesson three that the father of the periodic table was Dmitry Mendeleev. And Mendeleev came up with a really great way to organize the periodic table. Instead of just putting it in order um, like everyone else had, he actually arranged the elements um, by, by mass and by atomic numbers somewhat, but he also arranged them in groups according to common properties that they had with one another. And when he did that and laid it out, he actually had gaps in the periodic table that he had created that basically said, hey, there's some other elements out there that we haven't even discovered yet, and I'm gonna leave a space or a placeholder. And he ended up being correct. And so we have the modern periodic table um, that you can see behind me. And it's recently been added to, um, just in the last few years, a few man-made elements have been created and named. Um, they're not super exciting, they're man-made, they're highly unstable, and they don't last very long in the lab but we are up to number 118. And if this really interests you, I'm going to post a link to an article that just came out recently that suggests there might be an even better way to organize the periodic table. So let's take a look at some of the groups on the periodic table. The first question I get quite often when teaching it is, this is Frank, what about these two at the bottom? Why are they there? And really, I don't have a super cool answer for you other than they don't really fit very well where they're supposed to go. Um, these are sometimes called the lanthanide and actinide series, and they're also called rare earth metals. A lot of radioactive stuff down there. Um, uranium, number 92, for instance. Um, but these two columns, or sorry, rows, are actually supposed to be right up here in periods 6 and 7. All right, so we have this odd shape. What do we got going on here? Well, the first thing I want to point out to you is the groups or columns, and we sometimes call those families, and the rows or periods. So we have on our periodic table, there are actually seven periods. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the periodicity of elements on the periodic table isn't super exciting or cool. Um, the period number does tell us how many uh, rings or shells of electrons there are. So the first period is actually just made up of hydrogen and helium. 
and they only have one ring or shell of electrons. And that first ring can only hold two electrons. Okay? Um, now, hydrogen, because it only has one outer electron, we'll call those valence electrons, is actually highly reactive. Whereas helium has two outer electrons, its outer shell is full, and it neither wants to gain nor lose electrons. So it's not very reactive at all. That's why it's fairly safe to use in a helium balloon, whereas hydrogen in, for instance, the Hindenburg, um, was not really a great idea. It's extremely reactive and flammable gas. Okay, so if you are drawing an atom from the periodic table and you picked sulfur, for instance, you would know that sulfur, because it's in the third period, has three shells or rings of electrons. Okay, so as we go down the periodic table, there become more and more shells of electrons, and the elements themselves get bigger and bigger and bigger their diameters get bigger. And so their outer electrons are farther and farther away from the nucleus. And so they're a larger atom. What I find more interesting and what I'm gonna talk to you about a little bit right now is uh, the characteristics that exist in elements in those columns. And sometimes they're called groups and sometimes they're called families. And sometimes they're even labeled and numbered differently depending on the periodic table you're looking at. So my um, here calls them groups and we start over here with hydrogen this column right here um, is group 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 and then it bumps up to 13 14 15 16 17 and 18 now some periodic tables will actually um, consider from here to here um, a part a and then instead of having 13, sometimes it's called 3B instead. And that just depends on the periodic table. But when you're drawing atoms, one of the things that you can use on the periodic table is the column number to help you determine the number of outer electrons. Some columns follow the rule very nicely. Others do not. And I know sometimes students get hung up on that. So any element in this first column is going to have one outer electron. So we start with something really simple like hydrogen. It only has one electron. Um, all the way down to francium has seven shells of electrons and still only has one outer electron. These are really, really reactive elements because they just want to get rid of that one electron. Really, really bad. So family one or group one has one valence electron. Family 2 follows the rules. They have two outer electrons. And then things get kind of weird in the middle. The transition metals, the rare earth metals, um, they do have the same properties of metals. They have electrons they want to get rid of, but sometimes they come in varying forms. Sometimes they have two outer electrons. Sometimes they have three outer electrons. And so this middle section of transition metals, they're not real great rule followers. But when you jump over here to the boron family, number 13, or sometimes we'll just call it family three, um, they have three outer electrons. Family 14, the carbon family, or family four, has four outer electrons. Nitrogen family has five outer electrons. The oxygen family has six outer electrons. Fluorine, um, the halogen family has seven. And then the noble gases, there's an exception to the rule. It is family 18 or 8. All of them have 8 outer electrons except for helium. It only has 2. But the thing that this last family has in common is no matter where you are in this column, they all have electron shells that are completely full. And because they're full, um, they don't want to get or give any electrons. And so they're very, very non-reactive. So let's talk about some of these family names. I want to do a quick pitch um, for um, a resource that you might find. If any of these elements or families sound cool to you, remember you get to research an element for our benchmark two assessment. And this is one of my favorite books to learn more about the elements from the periodic table. Um, this is a book called The Elements, but you can find the exact same content online on the periodictable.com. 
and it's got some really, really cool um, pictures of each element. So things that you may not normally see in real life. And the thing I really like about it is it gives you information on where it is in the periodic table on each page. And again, this is also available online. Um, something else that's a companion to this um, is this box of cards. And it's the same publisher. Um, the cards are also labeled with a whole bunch of cool facts from each element on the periodic table. So if you have a chance, in my slideshow, you can see there's a slide dedicated to each family that I'm going to talk about and um, what they have in common and some cool properties. There's videos, there's links, there's little video clips if you don't really want to watch the whole um, half hour, hour video on each family. Um, but this is kind of just my final pitch to review with you what these families are before your assessment. So um, family number one, like I said, they all have one valence electron. They're very, very reactive. Um, this does not include hydrogen in this discussion because these are going to be our alkali metals. And these are extremely reactive metals. And when you think of metal, you might think of something like hard and shiny. These metals are actually soft. And if you were to have a sample in your hand, which you never would because it's really reactive and corrosive, um, it has the consistency of like a stick of butter. It's really kind of crazy. Um, lithium is the first element in this family and of all of them is the least reactive. Um, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium are all also members of this group. They all react highly with water. And francium is the most reactive and is also one of the rarest elements, um, at least metals, on Earth. And so as you go down the family in the metal side, they get more and more reactive. They are just dying to get rid of that other electron. And think of it this way. Um, as we go across the periodic table, think about which elements might want to get that electron from the metals on this side of the periodic table. All right, so these are the alkali metals. They all have one valence electron. They're shiny, silvery. You can cut them with a knife. They're really, really soft. And um, they're most often found in other compounds, okay? So with another element. And that makes them a lot safer. For instance, sodium, Na, which is from the Latin word natrium, is most often um, combined with chlorine in a substance that you're all familiar with. Sodium chloride is the compound for table salt. Now, sodium by itself is extremely reactive and would totally poison you if you tried to eat it. Chlorine, on the other hand, which we'll talk about in a minute, is a extremely toxic, corrosive yellow gas. By themselves have totally different properties, but combined together in a compound makes something very safe and very necessary for human life. Okay, um, potassium, also another very common substance in other compounds. Um, rubidium, not so much. Cesium and francium become a little bit more rare. Some of these elements, these metals in family one, are found in fireworks. And when we do our flame test demonstration next week, you're going to get to see what color some of these metals burn in fireworks. All right, family two is also a very reactive family of metals. These are called the alkaline, alkaline earth metals. So these were the alkali metals. These are the alkaline earth metals. And these are chemicals or elements that are very common in the earth's crust. And because they're also reactive, they're also found combined with other substances as well. But the difference is that these elements um, have two, two valence electrons. And so if you think of it in terms of how easy is it to get rid of electrons, family one um, just really wants to get rid of that one electron. Family two has two outer electrons. Eh, it's a little harder to get rid of two if you want to think of it that way. And a lot of these elements in family two are also found in fireworks. We have beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. And radium is a, a dangerous radioactive element, okay? Um, the middle of the periodic table is kind of just like, let's gloss over this middle. 
The transition metals have a lot of really, really useful elements, um, things that people are very, very familiar with. They're a heck of a lot more stable than the elements in family one and two. Um, for instance, you can find a lot of these transition metals in their pure form and they don't react with a lot of things. For instance, um, iron, although iron does rust and oxidize, it's a very um, easy to use, malleable, conducts electricity, strong um, element, and it can be used in alloys or mixtures with other metals as well. Our really great conductors are over here, copper, silver, and gold. Gold is actually the best conductor of the three, but as you can imagine, is quite expensive. Um, copper is a great conductor, but it's a lot cheaper than silver and gold. Um, if you buy high quality electronics, if you buy um, connecting cables that are gold plated, they actually do a lot better job connecting and conducting electricity um, because of gold's ability to conduct electricity better than those other metals. All right, moving across, there's one um, that I'd like to mention. Mercury is number 80. Mercury is the only metal that's in a liquid form in its natural state. And I don't know if you can see this from my video, but this symbol is in blue. And on my periodic table, blue indicates a liquid in its natural state. The rest of them over here, most of them are black. Um, I guess I'll point out hydrogen. Red means it's a gas in its natural state. So we creep over here to this, um, I call this the great divide, the great dividing line of the periodic table. Um, it used to be great orange, it's kind of faded. Um, this is the dividing line between the metals and the non-metals. And there are a few elements that touch this line that can't really decide if they want to be a metal or a non-metal. So we call them metalloids, and they have properties of both. Now I will point out that aluminum does touch the line but aluminum is not a metalloid. Aluminum is considered one of the transition metals. Um, but boron, silicon, germanium, astatine, uh, the rest of them are trans, or, I'm sorry, metalloids that have properties of both. And these are really um, interesting elements to research. Um, if you want, <clears throat> you know, to go to theperiodictable.com and you go, um, see if I can find tellurium for you. That's a pretty cool one. It is found in a lot of electronics. We find a lot of these in semiconductors and um, different devices that need to kind of start and stop conducting electricity at certain times. A fun fact about tellurium is it actually used to be used in making CDs, which I know are becoming far and few between as we go to a digital age. Very cool application of some of these metalloids. Now, um, we're, we're going to keep talking about, about valence electrons. Of course, I told you that the outer electron number is the same as the family number. But just to kind of talk about nonmetals as a group, things on this side of the periodic table tend to hang on to their electrons, okay? And some of them like to share electrons with other elements. And then as you get closer to family 17, they would really like to get your extra electrons to fill up their outer shell. Uh, a lot of the elements that we find in nature and that are very, very stable and combined in a lot of living things uh, would be some of our nonmetals like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. Those are all very common nonmetals. And they tend to be very brittle, um, like metals are, are malleable. You can melt them down. Um, they conduct electricity. Nonmetals do not. Nonmetals do not. Okay, and they're found combined in nature with a lot of things. In fact, nonmetals really like to combine a lot with metals. They're kind of like a match made in heaven. All right, my family that I like to really talk about the most is family 17. These are the halogen family. And the prefix halo comes from the Latin word that means salt. If you're familiar with minerals, salt's mineral name is actually halite. And the halogens are um, basically called the salt makers. Now you might be thinking of like salt, like salt that I sprinkle on my food. Um, sort of. Sodium and chlorine, which is one of the halogens, does combine to make sodium chloride, which is table salt. But any of the metals with one of the halogens is actually considered a salt. And sometimes we get salts form 
when we mix acids and bases together, okay? And it just so happens that a lot of the metals that I'm going to demonstrate and burn in class is um, a combination or, or salt. And my computer keeps going to sleep, so I have to keep um, putting it back on. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so we've got fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine in the halogen family. They all have seven outer electrons. And all they want is one more. Just one. Do we remember who likes to give one electron? That's right, this family over here. And if you have two halogens, they can actually hook up with somebody from family two because they just want to give away two electrons. So I have tons and tons of um, chemical combinations of a halogen and one of these metals from this side of the periodic table. Now, this is an interesting family. It's the only family on the periodic table that has all three states of matter naturally occurring. So fluorine and chlorine are both totally toxic, dangerous gases um, that would kill you instantly. They're very, very bad for your, for your lungs. And they're in red. They occur naturally as gas. Bromine is a fairly useful liquid used in industry. Um, it's naturally occurring as liquid and iodine. Now, I want to point something out, a really cool pattern here. On the metal side of the periodic table, as you go down the periodic table, things get crazy reactive. You've got to watch the video of the guy throwing different samples of alkali metals in, in a pond. It's crazy. As you get down to the cesium, it blows up. On this side of the periodic table, it actually is opposite. So the more reactive nonmetals are at the top, and as you go down, they get less, less reactive. So fluorine is the most reactive nonmetal on the periodic table, whereas francium at the bottom was the most reactive metal on the periodic table. Um, some of you may be familiar with iodine. Um, in its solid form, it's actually kind of like a, um, it's, it's, a, it's purplish, right? In liquid form, it can be used as a disinfectant, and when they wipe it on you before surgery, it's kind of got like this brown tinge to it. But um, obviously, you can put it on your skin, and it doesn't kill you, whereas fluorine and chlorine gas would, right? So very, very different pattern of reactivity over here. And finally, finally, hopefully, um, my computer battery holds out for the last part of this. This family over here is called the noble gas group, or sometimes they're called inert gases, which means we don't really do anything. And the reason is these gases are all very content in that they have all of their outer electron shells full. So if we recall helium, because it only has one electron shell, can only hold two electrons. It's full, it's happy, it's great. Um, as you go down, they all have eight outer electrons and they're very, very happy. So we have helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, which radon actually happens to be um, a cancer-causing gas or radioactive one as well. And I always get the question for people, neon, like neon lights? And actually, yes, um, these gases, because they're very non-reactive, can be used in different, um, different lighting situations. I'll show you a picture that I have in this book um, for neon, because it turns out that when you run an electrical current through these gases, they don't blow up, they don't react with other things, but they do glow. And they have a, a physical property um, that when their electrons get excited, they glow different colors. And so if you run electricity through neon, this is the color that you get, is this reddish orange color. All right. And all these different gases actually can have their own unique color. So for a neon light to really be neon, it has to be this color. If it's a different color, it's probably a different gas. And nowadays, we don't really use neon um, in signage. We use a lot of LED technology, which isn't nearly as fun. But um, neon lights can actually be very, very expensive because there's a lot of um, processes that go into making the vacuum tubes, putting the gas in, and running the electricity through. So that's the spiel on the periodic table. I could talk about it for hours. Hopefully you found an element that you love, that you really want to research. Hopefully you're ready for this assessment today. You know how to read the periodic table. You know how to draw atoms. 
you know where the families are and what they have in common. And when you take the quiz, you should have finished all of the assignments from benchmark one. And that includes your Adam drawing, okay? The journal about Dmitry Mendeleev and the history of the periodic table and your periodic table families grid worksheet where you can put in all that information that you found from the web. So I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again for a quick review. And this is our wrap up of benchmark one. Talk to you later.